So the, the CEO of Walmart introduced us and we spoke to the audience. And afterwards, he was standing in a corner and he wasn't busy. So I walked up to him and I said, hey, Bill. He goes, hi, Nancy. What a great story. And I go, great. I need your help. And he goes, what do you need my help with? I said, I need my help penetrating how to get my product on your shelf in Walmart. And he goes, you're not on the shelf? And I go, nope. He takes his business card out of his wallet. He hands it to me and he says, email me. I promise I'll get back to you. Welcome to the Invention Stories podcast, where we share stories of inventors who turn their idea into a product. Please visit our website at www.inventionstories.com. And now, from the Invention Stories Podcast World Headquarters Studios in Morro Bay, California, is our host, Robert Baer. Welcome to the Invention Stories Podcast. I am your host, Robert Baer, and thank you for joining us today. This is episode 14 of the Invention Stories Podcast, Nancy Tedeschi and the Snap It Screw Part 3. This is the third and final segment in a three-part series. Nancy Tedeschi is on the line from Daytona Beach, Florida. So let's get back to it. Some people are deathly afraid of sales or, or creating a sales pitch. Maybe somebody's like an introvert or something. How do you feel about sales or making pitches? Is that just like come with the territory and you're, you believe in your product and you've done it? Yes, I, um, I do not. I mean, I'm not afraid of sales at all. I know people that are afraid of sales, but that's the hardest part of this industry. I mean, I always say the idea is the easiest part. You know, having the idea is the easy part. Bringing it to the market is the part that stops everybody. I mean, I've met a lot of inventors in the last few years that have really good products that are sitting in their closets because they just don't know, they don't have an avenue to do it. They either don't have the money, the knowledge, they don't have what it takes to bring it to the market. You know, I was blessed that when I thought of my product, I had saved a little bit of money, but I, all the money that I saved, I used. You know, it's a big risk. No guts, no glory, no risk, no reward. You know the sayings that they say. There's a reason they say it. But there are so many people out there that have good products that are just sitting there because they're afraid. And I always say that fear stops you in your tracks. You'll stop dead in your tracks with fear. If you can overcome the fear, you can move past it. See, I don't, I'm not afraid anymore. I was, I was afraid like you. I was guilt ridden and afraid of everything. And once I spent 10 years in therapy and figured out how this really does work, you know, I'm not afraid anymore. But there are so many people out there that are, they have great ideas, but they're so afraid because they don't know how to do it. Or they're, like you said, too shy to do it. You know, if you're too shy to do it, then find a friend or a family member or somebody that you trust that has that advantage and can do that skill to help you do it. But, you know, people who are out there looking for products, they don't really pay attention to how you deliver the pitch. It's more of what your pitch is. And if you have a good product, it's pretty easy to sell it. There's a lot of inventors out there that don't have good products and think they do. That's another problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Y you know, the way I knew my product was good was by going to a trade show. You know, you go to a, I went to an optical trade show and just started showing it around to people. I didn't have a booth. I just walked around and met people and said, hey, look, this is my, you know, and that's how I met people in the industry. And that's, you know, I think that's the best way to find out about your product and what you have is to find a trade show that's in your industry and walk around it. Don't get a booth. Just walk around it, meet people, look at a booth and say, hey, would my product fit into their booth? Would there, you know, is my product a fit for this company? And Maybe not start talking to them right away, but what I would do is pick up their business cards because they're there to sell. They're not there to buy your product. So you get, you find out who's in charge of what they're doing. And when you leave that trade show, you now have a contact. And the other big piece of advice I'd give people is don't go through the buyers. And people hate it when I say that, but go to the research and development departments of companies. Because that's their job to research and develop. Those buyers, they get paid a salary and they're not going to help you out for one bit. But when you go through the research and development department of a company, it's a different story. They, you get their attention. How do you go about doing that? Do you just uh, show up and or try to schedule a, a time to meet the actual research and development? Or do you just call them on the phone, email? Well, I first start with LinkedIn. There you go. 
You know, LinkedIn is the best thing since sliced bread for me because let's just say I wanted to go to DuPont or some company like that. If you go on LinkedIn and put in DuPont, anybody who's on LinkedIn that works for that company's name comes up if they're on LinkedIn. And it tells you what they do, research and development, buyer, vice president, accountant, whatever. And that's where I start. Wow. You know, nobody's ever suggested that. You know, I'm always hoping to learn something new every time I talk to somebody. So that's great advice. When you were just starting, what was like the best use of your time and money? What what did you do that like really paid off? And you were like, what was it the trade shows or was it? People yeah, it was the mean? trade shows. The trade shows in, uh, I put like little ads in uh, little optical magazines, you know, and the opticians would see it and call me from the magazine. But really just getting into the industry where you're trying to be and meeting the people in that industry to navigate your way through that industry. And I was lucky because I had a whole nother optical industry to go through. You know, I had two avenues. I had the retail market, but that optical industry was huge for me. Because what happened was when I started making money from the optical industry, I was able to funnel that money into the retail part. So I was lucky. I mean, when I got that distribution agreement, that was a big deal. Because when I was distributing, when I was had that agreement, I was actually buying the screws myself from China, marking them up and selling them to the exclusive distributor. So I was making money by just pushing paper because the factory would send it right to the distributor, but I would get the invoice and order from the factory. So I was making money, and that money enabled me to get to the next step. Where are you at now, like in the U.S., for example? Are you in Walmart? Are you in... Yeah, I'm in. I'm actually testing in Rite Aid right now, if you know what Rite Aid is. It's yep. a pharmacy. Uh, Ace Hardware, Walmart, I'm trying to think. You know, there's little stores I'm in, little private stores, but I'm working right now on trying to get into Walgreens and Target and Bed Bath and Beyond. What was the so, first major chain that you got into? Walmart. Wow. So you just went and got into Walmart first. Did that help open doors for Well that was a else? story in itself. You want to hear that story? Of course. That's a that's a crazy story. I'm sorry so, to be taking so much of your time. No, it's okay. No, it's you know, okay. You're, you're pretty awesome. So <laughs> thanks. Um, so Walmart had a contest. It's called Get on the Shell, and it's actually it was an e-commerce contest. So you had to submit a one minute video, and it was all social media driven. This is back in the very beginning when I had no knowledge of social media at all. So. I submit my video to Walmart and they said, well, now you got to get votes. And I'm like, what do you mean I got to get votes? I'm like, I got a kid. I'm like, Mike, you need to help me. Get your friends helping me, you know. So there was 5,000 entries into this contest. And whoever got the most votes, the top 10 had to do it again. Then they had had a contest between the top 10. And then that narrowed down to the top three. And the top three were winners. So... I ended up saying, okay, I don't know what I'm doing here with social media, but I got to get votes somehow. So I ended up calling this woman in Chicago. I did some research and I had her make a screw costume. And we dressed up as screws and flew to New York City and walked around New York City dressed as screws, handing out these cards that said, text this number, help me win Walmart, get on the shelf contest. And I ended up getting on Good Morning America and the Today Show. We actually have Lester Holt holding my sign, get on the shelf. And I ended up being one of the winners. So there, I was one of the top three. So I thought that meant I was going on the shelves of Walmart. Because I thought that's what I was doing, right? right? Well, it was going on the e-commerce side of Walmart. So I messed that all up. It wasn't going on the shelves. It was going on their website. So I was so disappointed. I'm like, I did all this just to get on their stupid website, you know? Well, three weeks later, I get a phone call from Walmart, and they said, we're inviting all three winners to Bentonville to our annual shareholders meeting, and we would like you to come and share in our annual share meeting. So they flew us down first class. They put us up in a hotel with like Justin Timberlake, Leon Dion, all these people that sell their CDs there that were there to perform at their annual shareholders meeting. And the next day was a Saturday, and they asked the three of us to be speakers, Walmart has every month, one Saturday a month, a mandatory 
meeting for all their salaried employees around the world, either in Bentonville or via Skype. They all have to be there. So they asked us to talk. So the CEO of Walmart introduced us and we spoke to the audience. And afterwards, he was standing in a corner and he wasn't busy. So I walked up to him and I said, hey, Bill. He goes, hi, Nancy. What a great story. And I go, great. I need your help. And he goes, what do you need my help with? I said, I need my help penetrating how to get my product on your shelf in Walmart. And he goes, you're not on the shelf? And I go, nope. He takes his business card out of his wallet. He hands it to me and he says, email me. I promise I'll get back to you. So that night I emailed him. It was a Saturday night. I was flying back home on Sunday. I emailed him on Saturday and thanked him and asked him to help me penetrate the shelf. The next day I got an email from him. He copied his senior merchandising guy on it. No, mind you, I forgot to tell you this part. I had been to Walmart buyers twice already in Bentonville and not got on the shelf, okay? So he copies his senior merchandising guy. The guy emails me on Sunday and says, a buyer will be calling you tomorrow. And guess who it was? The damn buyer who I met with twice. They ordered 100,000 kits from me. Wow. Yeah. So not the traditional way of getting on the shelf. Did you have 100,000 ready to go? No, I had to <laughs> order them. <laughs> but yeah, there's always a way. You just got to think outside the box. You know, you can't be an in-the-box thinker. You just have to figure out how to get around the system because the system sucks and everybody knows that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it does. It sucks. So you just got to make it fun and try and figure out ways to go around it. So you would say a good piece of advice is just to ask the CEO of these corporations to put That's what I tell everybody (laughs) now. I said, put your package in, get a package and put it, send it to the board of directors. Here's my product. Can't seem to get through the front door, hoping I can get through the back. (laughs) You're listening to episode 14 of the Invention Stories podcast, Nancy Tedeschi and the Snap It Screw. This is the final part in a three-part series. The Snap It Screw can be purchased at our website at www.snapitscrew.com. At the end of each episode, I invite listeners to email us with questions or comments about the show. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about podcasting as well. You can email us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. Now, the question we've been asked most often recently is what kind of microphone should a beginning podcaster use? Now, the one that I've listened to and it seems like most of the top podcasters use is the Heil PR40. It's terrific, and if you're someone who wants to do something and do it right, the Heil PR40 is the microphone for you. If you would like to purchase the Heil PR40, we invite you to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash PR40. Now, we use the Audio-Technica ATR2100 here at the Invention Stories podcast, and it costs less than $80. To purchase the Audio-Technica ATR2100, please visit www com forward slash ATR. Now let's get back to the interview. Now, Nancy. You know, some people, they can't handle rejection. And so they get turned down. Okay, well, Walmart's off the table. Sounded like you were just saying no means not yet. You know, I mean, I That's I exactly it. right. That's exactly right. No is no for that moment. That's it. Don't take it personal. It's just that one moment in time they said no. Doesn't mean a year from now they don't say yes. And rejection is something that's personal. You can't do it. Don't take it personal. Take it as a, I always believe now that you're in the right place at the right time, at the right moment for a certain reason. And even when bad things go wrong, I always know in my lifetime that everything that's bad that's ever happened to me has turned out to be good. So when bad things are happening, you just have to remember that the lower you go, the higher you go. So while you're in that downward motion, if you can talk your brain into realizing that something good's going to come out of it, then all it's all good. So it's all in your attitude. So don't rejection to me. I don't even care anymore. Rejection to me is like you know you were bullied. Being bullied is worse than rejection. <laughs> you know. I am always hearing of these people that say you know these bad things happened in my life and it's helped me become the person that I am. I never could apply that to being bullying because I don't feel like that helped me be a better person or anything. I mean, I came to the conclusion and I truly believe that 
these bullies did have a pretty messed up life, you know. Oh, they do. And, and that I, yes, it did make me fortunate to have two parents that loved me. But at the same time, I don't think it made me better. It just makes me think like, I just have to forgive them. I mean, I could hunt one of the guys down who was bullied me when he babysat me and, you know, was just a little sadist. And I know I could just tear him up. But, you know, I mean, it's just like holding a grudge or getting revenge. It's not going to change anything. And No, you know it's what? only going to hurt you. It only hurts you. And the thing is, is that you are a better person because of it, because you would never bully somebody else because you felt on how that was. Yeah, I don't think I was ever wired like that, you know. I just, I was just kind of a happy guy. I just wanted to be left alone so I could just live my happy <laughs> life. I didn't want to be pushed off. I was pushed off a swing and beat up when I was in preschool. Like, why would somebody do that to another person? I liked everybody. I tried to be friends with everybody, you know. They're and still I, doing it. Yeah, They're still and, doing it. Kids and, are still bullying. Yeah, and, and I don't think it's that many, but I think they bully a lot of kids you know so i always say that bullies bullies aren't bad people they do a bad thing but like you said there's something going on in their life that has made them become that way and it's usually from their home and like you said you have to learn to try and be empathetic to why they are the way that they are you know you don't just be born a bully it doesn't happen like that we're not born bullies. We're taught how to do that kind of stuff. And somebody's not teaching them correctly. I mean, I just got back from Guatemala. Talk about a third world country and seeing how bad things can be. It's like, it's just a, it's sad out there. We can only give back what we can give back and hope we make a difference. Yeah, maybe uh, working with them will in some way change. I'm going to bring pickleball over better. there. I'm bringing pickleball over there. Yeah, you're bringing pickleball. Maybe Guatemala. Over be the to Guatemala. Yep, I am. Right. Next time I go, I'm bringing a setting up a court and going over and teaching the kids how to play pickleball. Nice. What was the hardest part for you personally, like throughout this entire invention process? What did you find the most challenging and, and what was your approach to overcoming it? Trying to get a product out there that, that you know is better than what's out there and having so many roadblocks put in front of you seemed very, it just seemed odd that something that should be so easy could have been so hard. I went actually into like a depression during the process at one time because it just was so mind boggling to me that it was so hard. You know, it's like, wait a minute, how can this be so hard? At one point, I put it in the closet for six months. I just threw it in the closet and said, you know what? This is way back in the beginning. This is before I went to trade shows and stuff. I just stuck it in my closet and for six months it sat in my closet and one day I was sitting at my desk working and my glasses broke and I uh -huh. took the screw out of my closet and I fixed my glasses in like 10 seconds and I'm like, I can't leave this in the closet. And that was the day that it changed for me. I just like, I can't do this anymore. But you know, I made a lot of mistakes. I spent money where I shouldn't have spent money, paid one of the sharks money on the shark tank to help me bring it to the market and they screwed me. And I always say if they want money up front, run, because if somebody really believes in your product and they want to help you, even if you want to pay them, pay them after it's done. Don't ever pay somebody up front for doing a job that hasn't been done. I mean, that's the worst thing about our legal system. Pay me and then I'll do the work. Well, wait a minute. No, I don't get paid before I do the work. You know, I got to do the work and then I can sell you my glasses or my kit, you know. But that's another piece of advice that I tell people is if people are asking for money to do something, get it in writing. Okay, I'll give you $10,000, but this is what you're going to do for it and get it in an agreement. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. Not, oh, give me $10,000. Maybe I'll help you bring it to the market. You know, no. You want $10,000 and I want a contract with you and I want specifically what you're going to do and what the outcomes are going to be. That's great advice. That is, yeah. I just have like three questions left okay. and, and I appreciate it. What social media do you use now and, and how do you determine what to use? Will you use a different social media for maybe your clothing line? Well, I use a different handle. I got a different name. It's Pickleball Bella, but um, I do Facebook, LinkedIn. 
Instagram and Twitter. And I actually got somebody helping me with that now because I kind of neglected it. Yeah. And I'm realizing how important it is to have a social media presence out there. I mean, that's the way of the world. That's the way of marketing is going to go. And I, you know, I think in the future, like you said, I think it's going to be a lot easier to bring a product to market. You know, make a crazy YouTube video with your product and it'll go viral. There you go. It's, you know, it's not too hard to do. I've got a lot of really good ideas, actually, to do them. I just haven't put them together yet, but I got a couple coming up with the screw. Yeah, no, that's that's good advice, too. I, I know that these people, the the younger generation, they have YouTube uh, celebrities and maybe even contact them because they already have a million followers or whatever. That's I, I like yeah. that. What have you enjoyed the most about being an inventor, being an entrepreneur? Giving back, helping other people. I really get a kick out of giving speeches and uh, motivational speeches. And I mean, I have a good story. I mean, I come from a, a place that I was like the least likely to succeed in high school, you know? So my biggest kick out of it is, I mean, if you could see my wall back there, I have patents all over my wall. It isn't the success of the money. It's the success of going through the process and being able to learn it so well that I can teach it now. I have something to give back, I, you know, and I, I like giving back. I feed the homeless every Tuesday and Saturday. I, we cook food for them, 125 people in our condos and bring it to them and feed them every Tuesday and Saturday. That's life. The other part of it is good and fun, but the best part of it is being able to contribute back to society. That's a great response. You know, most people tell me it's the independence or the freedom to or to live a life that, that brings you happiness and stuff. But I, I really like the giving back. I think that says a lot about you. Well, last question. Somebody has an idea for an invention and comes to you and asks for advice. What do you make sure that they clearly understand about it? The process, that it's not easy, that the biggest part of being an inventor is having tenacity and not being afraid of failure. I, you know, I wish that this country would get into these kids' heads that failure is good. You just take what you fail on and bring the good stuff forward and leave the bad stuff behind and get to the next part. Because failure is how we grow and how we make good decisions in the future. And so people look at failure as a negative. I look at it as a positive. So people, when they become inventors, have to realize that there's going to be failure it's going to take a lot of perseverance and tenacity to get anywhere close to getting a successful product. You have, like you said, 2 to 5% chance of making it with a product. I think with somebody who believes in your product, other than your, like if somebody came to me and if I believe in your product, you might have a 6% chance, you know? But I, I do try to be objective and I help people that I think have the stamina to get to the next phase because you need a lot of stamina. I didn't have to work a lot of hours, but I had to work a lot of hard hours. You know, a lot of grueling things that you have to go through to get there. You've been listening to episode 14 of the Invention Stories podcast, Nancy Tedeschi and the Snap It Screw. I want to thank Nancy for being our guest today. This is the final part of a three-part series. The Snap It Screw can be purchased at our website, at www.snapandscrew.com. If you're an inventor who would like to be featured on the Invention Stories podcast, have a suggestion on how we can make this podcast better, or would like to become a sponsor, please contact us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we invite you to give us a positive review at iTunes. An easy way to get there is www.inventionstories.com forward slash review. More information and show notes can be found at our website, www.inventionstories.com. If you would like to purchase the Heil PR40, we invite you to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash PR40. To purchase the Audio-Technica ATR2100, please visit www.inventionstories.com forward slash ATR. Thank you very much for listening today, and please tell a friend.